One in five Americans suffer from chronic pain. Many are now using CBD for relief. Activists are hoping pot could be legalized nationwide by the end of 2019. When you look at premium cannabis, the Illinois House approved legalizing recreational marijuana. Welcome to The Budding Report a weekly show centered around all things cannabis. Please join us in welcoming our host, Charles Horton, and his co-host, Melissa Nassitz, as they share the latest in cannabis news, conduct interviews with top leaders in the cannabis space, and promote some of the latest in science and innovation. And now to our host, Charles Horton. Well, welcome to The Budding Report. It's another cold day in Dallas, and I think we might be at 30 degrees. I know that we are a week out in filming, but know that it's cold here and that I'm missing our host today. Charles is still in Hawaii, still enjoying wonderful weather, and is unfortunately not able to join us today. So he will be sorely missed, although I'm sure he's not sorely missing that cold weather outside. Um, but I'd like to kick it over and welcome my co-host, uh, Dr. Christian Shaw and Chris Perry. How are you two doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing awesome, Dr. Shaw. It's uh, it's gloomy and dark here in um, Austin, too, just like it is in Dallas. But cannabis uh, stocks are shining brightly and warming us up today. So we talked last week about whether uh, cannabis stocks would be a GameStop moment. And it turns out that they're just exploding and there's good fundamentals behind them. Uh, if you watch this show, this show is really legitimated in many ways for people Um to buy these stocks, that this is something that's that's really there on the horizon to do. This show has given a tip of grow generation from one of our guests about three months ago when it was at 15. Um, that stock is quadruple bagged uh, by this point, meaning it's gone up to 60, gone up four times. Uh, my brother, who's a very invest investment savvy, has watched the show and he, he picked up on that tip. He also saw that, hey, there's things like Tilray that are at rock bottom, bought it at five for himself and my 19-month-old son. I came in at about eight a few days later and that went up to 60 today. So it's just a crazy, crazy, crazy time right now. And we think that there may be people out there that have some inside knowledge that's going to become legalized really quick on the federal government. Maybe there's some industry insight out there um, that says that. But I've never seen an explosion like this. And I don't think it's a GameStop thing where it's just going to go up and then come right back down. So uh, if, you, if you have any spare change out there to invest, I'd highly suggest getting in on that cannabis basket. Um, Leslie, do you have yeah, anything yeah. to add to all of that? Absolutely. You know, what, what I'll say is we have seen a little bit of uh, precedent for this type of activity a number of times. One, in this industry, a few years back, there was a, a very big surge. Uh, there was a big surge at the end of the year, right before, uh, Trump, right after the last election in 2016. And this really is a precursor to what's to come. What we saw in another industry 20 years ago, over 20 years ago with the birth of the internet, we saw half a, a billion dollars in public market cap turn to $2.9 trillion in public market cap in a four-year period. That was 20 plus years ago. <clears throat> now we're looking at something that in fact has more nuts and bolts economic power than even the internet did at that time in terms of industrial hemp and all of the things that that's going to affect like plastics paper, textiles, construction, and more. So what we're expecting is this is really not even the real show. This is the pregame show for what's about to happen as we see so many states in the United States going to a full adult use market, hemp being completely legalized, and a pretty uh, high likelihood of expectation that in the first 100 days of the Biden administration, we may see cannabis descheduled and regulated like alcohol and tobacco what that will do in terms of putting pressure on the on the united nations to act and take it off of the 1961 uh, uh schedule of um uh the single convention treaty uh will then allow you know we see mexico we see canada having done it we see uruguay and we will see more countries do it what that means economically is the surge in publicly traded stocks that are in cannabis hemp and the related industries will be unprecedented in the history of the public markets and so this is just the 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 sort of the the leaves on the water that columbus saw when he was coming across the ocean before he saw land he saw leaves letting him know that there was something coming and so this is what's happening next a lot of people are looking for that next Netflix stock that can make them a millionaire off of about a thousand dollars putting in do you think cannabis stocks have that potential leslie they absolutely so. 
that's, you know, the, the lottery ticket that makes you a million dollars is a very dangerous thing to try to do. Investing, you know, the professional traders are the ones that often make all the money off of the, uh, the amateur traders and a lack of discipline. And so what I'm going to say is first, always be disciplined in your investing approach. Make sure you're relying on, on due diligence. Make sure you're never putting money at risk that you can't afford to put at risk in these high risk, high growth stocks. Secondly, uh, yes, there will be stocks that are going to see extraordinary returns. In the same way that we saw 48,000% return in Amazon between 1996 or when it went public and when it hit its peak, you're going to see very similar types of things here. And what we need to really make that something that you can predict is we need these companies to be able to uplist to national exchanges when they do business in the THC market. That's going to be the moment you need to really look for. When that happens and you see companies uplisting onto national exchanges, the New York Stock Exchange, the American, and the NASDAQ National Market System, and they are in the THC business, they are in the adult use business, that will let you know that things have shifted dramatically. And that's when we're going to start to see those types of opportunities manifest. Well, you heard it here first. So <laughs> that was uh, Leslie Boscar. We're going to get to hear a little bit more from him as we uh, progress. We've also got Dr. Rob uh, Streinsfeld, uh, a natural medical doctor, and also with Doc Rob Holding. So we'll hear from them. They might uh, cue in a little bit more. We're going into a new uh, news article that was brought up uh, by our house doctor, uh, Dr. Christian Shaw. I'll kick it over to him to talk a little bit about this opioid-related death deaths that are lowering in counties with active cannabis dispensaries. So I think this could be a big link and also help towards, you know, opening up markets in areas that aren't at this current time. Well, thanks, Melissa. So as you stated, the title of this uh, article from the Clinical Psychiatric News is opioid related deaths lowering in counties with uh, cannabis, active cannabis dispensaries. So areas with cannabis dispensaries have seen a decrease in opioid-related uh, mortality, this new research suggests. Uh, this study was recently published in the British Medical Journal, uh, where researchers evaluated the prevalence of medical and recreational cannabis dispensaries in 812 U.S. counties within 23 states, uh, with some degree of cannabis legalization between 2014 and 2018. According to Dr. Sue, the co-author of the article said, our findings suggest uh, higher storefront cannabis dispensary counts are associated with reduced opiate-related mortality rates at the county level. So for many of us, this is intuitive. We know that cannabis has uh, ever-increasing application of various medical and psychiatric conditions. Uh, and so I don't think anyone on this show is surprised, but the benefit of articles being published in you know, very established prestigious medical journals is that this further helps legitimize cannabinoid medicine and pushes it into the forefront. Back to you. <laughs> well, thank you. I, and of course, you know, anytime we can help with this opioid crisis that is going on in the United States, it's more to the better. So uh, as you know, all of us here are very uh, pro-legalization. So we'll be hopeful to watch and see as it opens up and what we find out. We're going to go ahead and take a quick commercial break, and then we'll be right back and get to hear a little bit more from Leslie Boscar. Coming to you after our hike that we finished, Buster exercises three miles. Today is a recovery day because he did eight mile hike over the weekend, broken up into two. What I want to share with you is this company here called Simple Changes. I learned about them and I absolutely love the concept. It's wellness, community, and organization. So as you can see here, I love the wrapping. I love purple and it comes with three products. So I've been trying them out. First, it's the hemp oil spray. Then it's the hemp oil dropper and the hemp oil ball. So I'll be trying all of these out. I've been exploring them, exploring the ingredients. I met with the team on Zoom. Um, really, really, really neat product. And I love the fact that they also want to incorporate healthy practices. So they come with a little journal and something about simple success guide. So, simple changes. 
Well, now I get to officially welcome Leslie. Leslie is with Ele Electrum Partners. He is the executive chairman. And most folks in the cannabis industry for any length of time are familiar with him by face name. His exuberant laugh and immaculate three-piece suits. We're very excited to have him back on the show. Um, uh, he mentors up-and-coming executive and businessmen and his far-reaching banking and entrepreneurial experience is definitely something that we can turn to. We heard a little bit about him, about the, the stocks that are coming up. Um, but let's ask him, why are you in a public uh, company now? Now is the key component of that. The, the real, you know, I have been speaking publicly about the, pub, about the liquidity needed for this industry, the challenges associated with capital formation the, that are unique to this industry due to the legacy that comes from prohibition. And as we transition from this being a, a prohibited industry to a regulated industry, the banking and financial markets are very slow to follow. So the short answer is, I have been preparing for the public markets and to be involved in the public markets since I, before I actually formally got involved. It has been my focus of my career uh, since 1987. I've been focused on the public markets and anything I do, I tend to look at it from the perspective of where will the real liquidity opportunities be? Where will the capital formation be? Where will I have the opportunity to have the greatest effect in what I do. And so I've always looked at the public markets as a pivot point, as a leverage point that could allow me to achieve certain results. I came into this uh, anticipating that there would be a time when getting access to the public markets for liquidity, for the ability to bring capital to bear, and for the ability to use publicly traded currency as uh, a way to acquire assets was going to matter in general. And so I have advised people on this, I've been involved in it, and I've always wanted to make sure that my own path in the industry was going to be charted by the same advice I gave others. And so with the impending changes that are coming as a result of the Bind administration and many other things that have led to where we are, the timing was just right uh, about a year ago to start preparing, and I'm, I'm continuing to follow up on that now. Well, and you mentioned when we when we opened uh, about the first 100 days and possibly seeing, you know, decriminalization happening then. If you were hard-pressed to put about when do you imagine things would absolutely change, could you, could you pinpoint a time more specifically, or do you think it's going to happen in those first 100 days? So, uh, let, so I'm going to say that I think we will see major changes in the first 100 days of the Biden administration, that whether they result in the actual passing of legislation, executive action, or other, will point to those things happening in 2021 calendar year. And to be clear, you can go back to my public appearances going back to 2014 and my various public speaking engagements. This has been the same thing we have been looking forward uh, to that entire time. And so the pressure that is created, so the short answer is I expect in 2021, I expect in 2022 that we'll see regulatory schema established for the federal government that will allow this to start really being regulated on a national basis uh, as, as well as on a local basis so that the governments, the federal government and the state governments will be able to work together. That's the short answer. The contextual answer is that this pressure has been building for years. When you have so many states that have created public markets for adult use cannabis, uh, California, uh, Illinois, N Nevada, Colorado, the list goes on and on. You're talking about something approaching 30% of the United States that currently has adult use. You're talking about less than 10% of the United States where cannabis is still illegal. Less than 10%. Under 30 million people still live in a country where cannabis is still illegal, meaning 200, uh, 300 million people still have medical marijuana in some form or adult use marijuana in some form. So my point in saying that is now we see New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Delaware, Maryland, Florida, um, Ohio, 
uh, all of these states are either in process for establishing adult use markets or contemplating adult, adult use markets, which means if it takes them a year, you'll be talking about over 50% of the United States having adult use cannabis. The federal government cannot can only ignore that so long. A very dear friend of mine who is a mentor in politics and strategy, Joe Bresney, without whom we would not have adult use cannabis in Nevada, and and candidly, probably the country would be a little bit, um, have been a little bit slower in what it's achieved without his work. He always has said that you can count on a politician to do the right thing once you've removed every other choice. Then, and as a result, we have to be in the business of removing choices from elected officials in terms of what they're doing. Well, that's what's been happening. It's become so obvious now that the only path the federal government has is to deschedule and to establish uh, regulations similar to alcohol and tobacco on a national basis that we're looking at that within the next year. So to recap, this year we'll see major shifts in policy, executive action and legislative action, followed by regulatory action uh, at the latest in 2022. So in anticipation of this, um, Leslie, how do you evaluate a good public opportunity and would advise uh, individuals on one to avoid? So great question. The, you know, this is all about due diligence. Your questions are going to be, pardon me, my apologies. You're going to be focused on your due diligence and the, the why the public markets get the type of premium in terms of value to private. So a private company that is worth X will be worth four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 X or more when it's publicly traded. Why is that? It's because of the transparency. Once you have fully reporting public companies, they have to have audited financials on a quarterly basis and, and they have to file those with the securities and exchange commission. They have to have annual reports that are audited as well. And they have to report m any material change in the business as it happens. So you get to see with some type of reliability and veracity what is actually happening in the business. And that allows you to give it a valuation that is going to have less fuzziness than it would be in the private sector. So what that means is when you see companies that are fully reporting and you can read their their filings, do it. If you're going to be putting any substantial money at risk, read the filings that the companies have. Read the analyst reports as they start to come out. Do your due diligence. Try to understand what the company is doing, why it's doing what it's doing, who the people involved are, and what the future could really be, then you can make a much more informed decision before you put your money at risk. And so once again, you've got to look at all of the things that are out there, all of the businesses that are out there, read the filings, understand who's involved, get deep inside your due diligence if you're putting any real money at risk, and then and then make a decision after you've been able to do that. Also look at what other investors are doing, what other people who are familiar with the markets are saying. Find ways to get access to their, their newsletters. Uh, Alan Brockstein has been uh, very effective in disseminating information. Javier um, uh, Hassa, the uh, author, the journalist, has been incredible in putting a lot of information out there. Look for these reliable sources of information. Uh, listen to what they have to say. Don't follow exactly what they tell you to do. Uh, Take it under advisement and then make your own decisions based upon that until such time as you can buy funds and other professional investors, uh, you get access to professional investors and their ability to make decisions for you in the public markets. Leslie, uh, last week's GameStop um, incident really illustrated, I think, some of the challenges in public markets, especially the tensions between retail investors and these hedge fund uh, investors. You have a lot more experience in, the, in this than me. Can you tell us about some of these, what you think are the biggest challenges in the public market? And most importantly, how do we overcome them? That GameStop is both a, um, a victory and a tragedy. 
and we'll see what really happens. GameStop is an example of how when you see a surge in individual investors doing things at the same time, they can overpower even the most well-capitalized professional investors. That being said, there was a brilliant trader once, I believe it was Warren Buffett, who said it's not timing the market, it's time in the market. And so GameStop is still not, the, the ending has not been written. And what I mean is, and then I'm going to answer your question in a couple of different pieces. What I mean is, when I look at the overview, uh, does the management of GameStop take advantage of this opportunity to reinvent their business and to evolve and to become a leader in what they're going to do because they were given this extraordinary opportunity to raise capital and to reestablish themselves? I, I'm of the opinion that traditional brick and mortar retail must evolve in the current world to keep itself relevant. What made sense 10 years ago, one year ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago will not make sense today, next year, or three to five years from now. You need to be thinking about how to keep your business relevant and providing value to consumers and to your customers, not just today, one year from now, three years from now, five years from now, and more. And GameStop has an opportunity to take a deep breath, bring some capital in, and now think about how to deploy it as they evolve. So now let me just give some context on the professional investor versus individual investor friction and that what's going on and why I say there's a tragedy as well. For a short period, the individual investors were having a victory. There was the short squeeze, there were tails of funds that were losing enormous amounts of money. If the professional investors have patience, and they almost always do, because they have the capital necessary to be able to deal with the volatility associated with things like this, they're just going to wait. And, and, as, and as they wait, their bet is that GameStop will not reinvent itself and it will continue to be a shrinking business in a shrinking industry not gaming but retail and their business model and that all they need to do is wait for the, the gravity to take effect it can only stay afloat for uh, a, a certain amount of time like the coyote in the bugs bunny in the roadrunner cartoons who goes out off the cliff the cliff falls and there he is pumping his arms and his legs in the air in that circle while he's still floating in the air. But you know, any moment now, he's going to come crashing to earth. And that's the tragedy of GameStop. If the company is ineffective in reinventing itself, it will start to, once again, follow the laws of the markets and the rules of the markets, and it will start to likely come down substantially. And then the patience and the time in the market of the professional investor versus the trading opportunity of the individual investor will turn into a game of musical chairs. And the professional investors already have their chairs and the individual investors are out there struggling to find a way out. And do they get to get out and get their chair and, and, and come out with a profit or at least not take a loss? Um, I am concerned that they will not be able to um, see that happen. Definitely say it's been very interesting to watch. Um, and even people that I know that have never been involved in the stock market are looking and with interest at this story because it is sort of a Cinderella story and hopefully GameStop will make this work. But the problem with most Cinderella stories is they're fairy tales, right? <laughs> but I'd like to thank you, Leslie, for joining us today. Your insight is very, very valid and very, very welcomed and timely. So thank you again for sharing some of your, uh, your expertise with us today. Uh, any of our viewers can reach out to Leslie um, all of his contact information is available on our website at thebuddingreport.com, as well as with any of our other guests. So please take the time to reach out to him. Uh, he would welcome hearing from you. So we're going to go off for a brief, com brief commercial break. We'll be right back with our next guest after this message.
Hello, hello, here on my lunch run in the middle of the heat where I get my break really quick after training clients and training, leading some classes. I am taking my Simply Satisfy. It is three sprays, organic hemp. Uh, next one is my Simply Start. You can take it twice a day or once a day. I already took one morning dose. So I'm now taking my afternoon dose. One little yummy organic hemp. Try to check them out, Simply Genius. Helicopter. <laughs> All right, time to go train and run down the hill. Bye bye. <laughs> Well, welcome back. We're with Dr. Rob, Doc Rob Streisfeld. He is a doctor of naturopathic medicine. And Christian, you're still my favorite doctor, but I'm a big fan of NDs as well. He's a certified natural food chef and passionate consumer advocate and educator, especially when it comes to all things cannabis. With over 18 years in natural and uh, health and natural products in the industry. So we're very excited to have somebody with your expertise here. So how did you originally get into natural? Pathic medicine. Well, great. Thanks for having me here, and it's wonderful to join the show. I love Leslie's talk, and I've, I've got some consulting with Leslie and his team. <laughs> awesome. They're awesome in the past. If you're in cannabis, again, Electrum and Leslie are definitely the go-to. Um, but for me, like most people getting into healing, I had my own personal health crises. I had my own issues growing up. I had digestive issues. I had cystic acne on my face. I had a lot of things that the allopathic or traditional model wasn't helping me with. They were trying to just give me a pill and they had no explanation as why it was happening or when I'll be off that pill. And so those things kind of drove me down just to discover. And I studied anthropology and, and traditional medicines and traditional foods in my undergraduate. So how did cultures before the pill deal with these health issues? And then I went to naturopathic medicine to learn you know, how to heal more naturally and more importantly, prevent disease. You know, that's what I think people don't understand is that we are here to prevent you getting sick, not just waiting to be reactive for you to get sick and then need something to resolve it. And then with that culinary school, although a lot of people made fun of me back then, going to a plant-based, vegan, vegetarian focused culinary school many years ago was simply because everyone I ever met ate and they didn't necessarily have a cancer or pain or sleep issues, but everyone ate food. So I like to, you know, start at that foundational point and use that as part of my practice and my career going forward. That I love dealing with food as medicine. I think so much of what we can do, we can do through our diet. Um, and people try and fix diet with exercise. It's such a small portion. It's 90% of what you do beyond that makes a difference. So, and you know, treating the, the issue at hand, not the symptoms, all of these things just go hand in hand and lead me right into my next question. Um, obviously, uh, naturopathic, plant medicine. So where did that transition into cannabis for you? Well, I have to say that I grew up in New York, which I'm excited to see what happens in the Northeast these next couple of years with cannabis as a whole. I actually have a hemp license and engaging in a project this summer up there. But I grew up about 10 minutes from where Woodstock occurred in 69. My dad rode his motorcycle into, into Woodstock and had a wonderful party in 69. So celebrating anniversaries, cannabis was never so foreign. It was not so... It was another thing we grew and we, you know, utilized on a more regular basis. But going forward, studying plant medicines, having to deal with pain of my own and learning that not only cannabis, but so many plants have this power to heal uh, and resolve pain and to reduce inflammation. That when being out in Arizona, the West Coast, I, I automatically saw the opportunities in cannabis uh, and I jumped on. I'm a medical director of dispensaries in Arizona. I work to educate as many people as possible from the retail side to the consumer and patient side. And then I also you know, see where this fits into the natural products industry. And I have to say, I was one of the first to recognize a CBD product from hemp being introduced into the natural products, natural health retail stores, health food store industry many years ago, probably in early 2014, 2013. Um, that was MJNA, uh, Medical Marijuana Inc. was one of the first ones to try to introduce that and hemp meds and saw that there was going to be a need to guide that properly into the natural products paradigm. There's a lot of rules, regulations, although most people don't see that FDA warning on the bottle of dietary supplements. There are a lot of guidelines and rules, uh, CGMP, good manufacturing practices. So I was trying to use my dietary supplement natural products experience and connections to guide these cannabis and hemp companies through the right processes to create good, safe products for the consumers and for patients. So it was a natural fit. So that's a perfect transition to my question. Uh, what are some of the challenges with CBD and the related uh, CPG products? 
you know, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, I've watched this industry grow and, ex- and shift over the last six, seven years, give or take. And the first thing is that there's a lot of people that get into the space for the quick buck. And they're just white labeling, they're, you know, they're private labeling, they're throwing things in a bottle, selling it on Amazon or online at a website. They don't know what's in their product. They don't know how it's going to affect the user. They haven't done the full due diligence. And again, what Leslie said earlier, when it comes to investing in, in stocks and businesses, do your due diligence, do your research. So for me, it's the same thing when it comes to supplements or creams or topicals or anything you put in and on your body. You got to do your research. So there's so many. There's over 6,500 CBD brands right now, uh, all trying to get you, the audience, is you know to you know, loyalty and to purchase it. So now you have to talk about where are you buying it? Health food stores, cannabis dispensaries, online. Now I'm I'm looking at the the growing trend of CBD only retail stores, CBD stores dedicated to those type of retail products, and I like them actually. I'm actually fond of that because. The research I've been doing is they're having tremendous vetting processes. Uh, one that I like is CBD Emporium out of Arizona. They're growing. And the fact is they have a vetting process. So they're carrying many brands, many products, but they're doing that hard work for the consumer before the consumer comes in the door. They're kind of filtering out some of these bad actors, these unqualified uh, or unqualified quantified products. These are things that are really important for patient safety, consumer safety, and legitimacy of our industry going forward. So speaking of going forward, Rob, um, what areas are, is your company most interested in moving forward in cannabis? It's a great question. And, um, you know, there's so much talk about CBD. And I love that we had a big portion of the conversation about the THC aspects of the industry as well. But those are only two of over 500 compounds in the plant. So I definitely see the trends. Obviously, we're talking about minor cannabinoids, CBN, THCV, CBG. These are all starting to pop up in more mainstream conversations. Personally, I think the terpenes have been given some exposure, but not fully understood, especially with the correlation to essential oils and other plant medicines. Um, We see a lot of interest in, um, for me personally, the whole plant. I see that there's attributes to this plant from the root to the to the bud, which now in some nomenclature are referring to as, as the fruit because it has seeds. Um, the leaves to me are tremendously valuable. And you know, I look at this plant more often as a vegetable than a drug. As a plant, we grow in our garden with our kale, our spinach, our tomatoes, our cucumbers. And if we look at it from that perspective, we can help this movement to destigmatize this plant, to put it into our everyday you know, act, you know, usage, which is what we're seeing with even CBD studies that I've tried to advocate for years ago, um, which were, hey, if you do a little bit of CBD every day, whether you're sick or not, will there be benefit? And these wellness studies are starting to show that, yes, even a small amount of you know, these cannabinoids, because we have this endocannabinoid system in our body, every one of us does, that we are going to see some benefits, some movement towards homeostasis and move away from disease. And for me, that's really important. Talking about the whole plant, not just isolating one individual common, you know, compound for a drug, that's great for a stock play or a pharma play. But when you're talking about healing people, this whole plant is really where we're at. And the research that I'm looking at is a lot of that of the different components of the plant and their other attributes beyond the medical or drug component. So when we talk about the Northeast going adult use, we talk about the East Coast going adult use um, and all these more states, it's really important that, A, I, I still believe we should have grow your own rights, but let's talk about that from a realistic standpoint. Six or eight plants a person isn't going to make someone a millionaire. You know, so the idea is if you can grow your own tomatoes in your backyard, wonderful. If you grow so many tomatoes that you're going to bottle them, can them, and sell them in the health food store, that requires a license, a permit, registration, certain standards. We need to look at that, and I hope with the new uh, administration and this descheduling, hopefully, and this new perspective on the plant, we'll get to that point where, you know, we can have a little bit of this our own self, but it won't hurt the industry by any means, allowing that to happen. As this ties in, is that we see this resurgence or this movement in psychedelics. And and what I want to say about psychedelics is that with psychedelics, it's a big category uh, from mushrooms to, to LSD. And you can have your opinion, but micro dosing is a key component of the benefits of psychedelics. And I want people to understand that you can also look at micro dosing cannabinoids and having a physiological functional impact to your health and well-being. I don't see in historical uses, anthropological uses, cultural uses, us concentrating this plant 
thousands and thousands and thousands of times with these compounds in this plant so much that that is what the the body naturally is needing. So I think that microdosing or smaller amounts of cannabinoids in a more daily use, I think therapeutically will be a big focus over the next several years, not just how much is in it. Can I get more percentage of THC? It's not going to be the long-term value of the plant. Well, I'm a big advocate of everything in moderation, so I completely concur with that. But thank you so much for your insight, Dr. Rob. It's been wonderful having you on and hearing a little bit more about the movement through natural medicine and the use of cannabis there, because it seems like a completely natural fit. We'd like to thank both of our guests today. Um, It was wonderful to have Leslie and uh, Doc Rob back here on the show to tell us a little bit about both the balance of financial and health. If you'd like to contact either one of our guests, please do so on our website, thebuddingreport.com, as well as watch any past episodes or contact any of our past guests. Um, We look forward to seeing you next week. We will be uh, joined by Nathaniel Gurin from FinCam and Dr. Ted Emanuel at TDX Wellness Solutions. So please make sure to take time to join us next week. And thank you for being a part of our show today. Have a great one.